you know, we had Infinity to AI, a YC company. So as people know, YC has done Demo Day recently. And what's interesting is, you know, obviously there's a big batch of AI companies. Uh, that should be no surprise. But what's fascinating is a lot of these AI companies um, are, uh, you know, I mean, they're starting to, you know, do demos and stuff. So yesterday there was this two Infinity AI that made waves because it actually did their entire YC Demo Day video. YC is, of course, Y Combinator, which is a big um, incubator, probably the foremost incubator globally. Um, but they did an entire demo, demo day video with an AI generated version of their CEO, which is of course, you know, not, uh, not, not a difficult thing to do. I think this is perhaps a historic first. So I just put that up in the nest, uh, just to give some updates. Cause that's hot off the press that that kind of came through, uh, yesterday. So yeah, I mean, I'd be curious, uh, you know, maybe I'll go to meta prime meta. What's your thoughts about, you know, I don't know, either this or anything else kind of new in the AI space and the crypto space, uh, we'll be happy to hear your thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I saw you post this video the other day, and, and it was definitely really interesting. Um, I mean, you can you can tell there's like a little bit of uh, like it's it's not super hard if you're paying attention to pick up on the fact that it's AI generated, but it definitely is very clean, like comparatively. Like if you weren't paying close attention, like it could definitely slip by you. Um, and you know, it's this is like a constant conversation that we have in the space. It's like, all right, at what point? does it make sense to to use these tools and how will this have an effect on society and so i think that's probably a big thing that we're going to get into today but it is really exciting to see stuff like this because it really should drive home for a lot of people that like the hype around ai and what's coming and how big of a shift it's going to be it's it's not just a bunch of smoke it's really actually starting to happen now yeah yeah definitely you know i mean mercifully this is not one of the political spaces where we can get quite heated um you know, I think good debate is encouraged, but, uh, you know, there's a limit uh, to it. But, you know, uh, our, our big topic of the day is crypto and AI and trading. And so, you know, do you want to focus on that? But perhaps a little segue into, you know, it is an election year, right? And there are these fake videos um, that are being popped up everywhere. You know, there's a Mark Zuckerberg fake video that popped up that was pretty convincing. Uh, there were several others. So I guess given, and of course, obviously, there's a lot of wars going on in the world as well. So maybe a slight detour into that. I mean, what concerns either Meta or AGI or others? Um, what concerns uh, do any of us do? Do we have in general about um, you know this and the kind of tumultuous times uh, that we live in? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I saw um, there's this uh, one account as like IB or something like that, and he made uh, an AI generated video of Sydney Sweeney talking about some. Uh, some like uh, genetics, uh, you know, bell curve uh, conversational topics that can be kind of spicy. And, you know, it's, it's funny because, right, it's like the medium is the message, right? Like if you, you have, uh, you know, Sydney Sweeney and her <clears throat> assets, you know, that sometimes people pay a little bit more attention to stuff like that. And so it's, it's really funny to kind of see the, uh, the different ways, because I, I don't think it's going to be as pernicious as like, Oh, like here's a clip of like you know Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk or someone like that saying X, Y, or Z thing. I think those will be able to be debunked pretty quickly. It's more of like the entertainment value, like the meme videos and those kinds of things that will be generated from this. I think that's going to have much more of an effect than just the huh. um, you know the the deep fake stuff. That, that's really interesting. So you're less concerned about. I mean, I, I'm actually kind of. You know, I mean, people can't tell the difference, as you noted, with some of this stuff, and people can believe all kinds of things. I think that happened even in the last election cycle. I feel like it's going to be more pronounced. Are you not as concerned about, like, I mean, I'm, I'm curious about your, yours meta, but also a, perhaps AGI's perspective. Like, I don't know, I, I'm concerned. Let's put it that way. I don't, I don't want to be, I often try not to submit my own opinion so I can hear the smart opinions of everyone else and learn, but um, I, I, I must say I'm certainly not uh, unconcerned, right? I don't know, AGI, what do, what do you think? Um, yes, it's, it, it's highly concerning. And I think a lot of people will do that and not say anything. And this is what is worrying a lot. Because the people so the people that, that say they are doing it, so we have no problem with that. But most of the people will, I mean, the teams that are highly motivated to use that, they have a reward. Uh, I, I, I see it. I think the tools are the tools are there, and obviously we can do much much more better than the demo that we are seeing. And if it's motivated by money, by political power, and so on, I, I will. My feeling is that it will be used to the full extent that it's possible for them to be used without being 
catch and so on. So uh, it's highly concerning. So uh, I, I don't know what, what it will give, but it's definitely, uh, I, I think it's the most concerning election year ever. Yeah. And, and we, have, we have no solution. Well, we, we, we could have solution, but they are not deployed. So uh, we could use, for example, the blockchain and so on. And, uh, but it's, they are not deployed for, for some reason. I, I don't know why, but uh, I, I see that it's highly concerning. And the people that are in power, uh, they, have, they don't have much interest to see them, the solution to be deployed. And uh, so, uh, so, so it's... So it probably won't be deployed, right? And if the powers that be don't want to deploy it, yeah, I think there's definitely yes. some concerns about so, so, whether... So, so, yeah. so the, the, the way I see that is that maybe each, every party think that they will be using that kind of solutions so much uh, more than the other party than they don't want to deploy a solution. Sure. Or uh, mm -hmm. anyway, it will, it will give an equi equilibrium anyway. So, uh, but uh, it will not be, it will not reflect democracy. So uh, mm -hmm. that's concerning for democracy. Yeah, uh, but, uh, but I'm excited for the for the for the news for the latest developments in the last week. Uh, so we are moving into agentic AI. It's highly exciting because now we have agent that use LLMs and so on to make decision to design other to, to code and so on. And uh, so this is this is moving extremely fast. So agentic AI is getting there, and that will move fast and be highly effective, and uh, so we're on that exponential. Uh, we have the 100 billion Microsoft Stargate computer that is probably coming, so it's exciting, and we're we moving out so far next year. Uh, quantum computing, quantum AI, and so on, uh, which should be there next year. So if you combine that with agent AI plus quantum computing, uh, that is getting almost pretty much ready right now. So that that's that will give uh, an improvement of maybe, if we have quantum AI, it will give an improvement of one million times, something like that. So uh, add that to agentic AI, uh, which is a huge improvement on LLMs. Uh, I mean, LLM are not so powerful, but agentic AI, it's really, really powerful. So uh, yeah. we are moving there. So, okay, uh, yeah. Def Definitely want to put a pin in that because I think it's it's super important uh, to talk about. And of course, quantum computing, I mean, of course, in, as it relates to, I mean, true kind of quantum computing um, with enough qubits because it could, of course, render most L1s, including probably Bitcoin, which is not quantum proof, right? Because um, the way uh, crypto works, I, I think for those who don't know, just a, a quick, you know, um, PSA on it is uh, they work by uh, RSA encryption, right? So therefore, you can't, you know, go and hack the private keys. However, quantum computers can uh, factor large polynomials, right? In, um, you know, in a relatively short period of time in a way that regular computing cannot. And that would mean that it could break RSA encryption, which would break a lot of things, right? I see John, I'm definitely John, I'm going to go to you about AI updates and perhaps get your thoughts on agentic AI as well. But uh, I know just to stick on this political point, maybe just for a moment, I'll, I'll hand the back mic to Meta before, um, yeah, before me, I'll hand the back mic to Meta and then hand back to AGI and John. So Meta, go for it. Mike is yours. Yeah, I just real quick. I, I mean, uh, again, I'm going to push back on this idea that like this is going to be a huge factor. I, I just don't see it. Like the the analogy that I give is like, well, you know, someone could make a like a forge a document or something like that, and then put it up and be like, oh, you know, look at this document that says you know aliens are real in Area 51 and blah blah, blah you know whatever it is, right? Like people, um, I think we already have like a pretty good BS detector. Like, you, you, you know, information generally has to come from, like, you know, if it's going to be an official video from of, like, Biden or something like that, like, they're probably going to pu push it out there, right? Like, if someone makes a deep, deep fake of Elon, like, he's going to, like, and it gets big enough that it needs to be refuted, he'll refute it, right? Like, th there's, there's enough, like, there is an arms race in this stuff where the AI creation, the AI detection will be in kind of lockstep. Um, and then to some, I think AI, uh, AGI made the point earlier about like well you know it doesn't seem like they care too much like to me my concern is you know they use this they let this go on right and have all these defects created and go out into the net and then they use that as a way to like regulate and push requirements of like oh we need to you know put a fingerprint on like any ai generated content stuff like that like i really don't want to see regulation come in 
um, and kind of like to try to strangle this or try to like give a, you know, make sure that people ha don't have any anonymity in, in creating stuff like this. I think that that is really important. And so, but, but, you know, my, my general take is if you're really looking for the impact that these artificial generated videos are going to have, I think it's much more going to be around the entertainment meme content uh, and not so much kind of like credible videos that are going to, you know, slander different opponents or political opponents and stuff like that. Oh, man, your, your faith in uh, humanity's understanding of what's real and what's not is, is reassuring, uh, though, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, so I, I do want to go to AGI and I'll go to John because I, I, I think there's a lot of great news you, you got. And then we'll go to Kayla, of course, welcome to the space. But to AGI, maybe if you have a response before we go to John, uh, let me know. Well, I just think it won't be uh, videos and so much. Uh, I think it will be used in a more subtle way uh, to gain an advantage, and there are many, many ways to do that. And I want to point also regarding quantum computing that um, with uh, agentic AI, I'm not sure about the mathematics that we have, so the encryption and so on. I'm not sure it's it's good. Uh, so we 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 have we are limited in, in terms of as human beings to some kind of IQ and understanding of the universe and of mathematics. And if we have AI agents that are so capable, I'm I'm not sure that the mathematics and the physics that we have right now, and I'm a physicist, uh, that we have right now is good and it's adequate. So uh, it can it could break much much more things than just the encryption, mm -hmm. uh, because we we are going to discover I think true mathematics, uh, true physics of the universe and so on, which would be amazing. Uh, but I think much much more things are going to break than on the the encryption. Yeah, maybe grand unified theory on the horizon, right? Well, like I said, uh, that, that, we'll that, that, that would be great. Uh, but uh, I would be great. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah, but I, I see that I see grand unification theory is, is is extremely great. I don't know if it exists. Uh, maybe it doesn't exist. Right. I, I don't know. But we will see. We will find out. But uh, the, the, just the fact to discover to understand much much more the universe. And, and then to be able to, to play with the universe, to experience the universe to the full extent, or much, much more. Just that is extremely amazing. So, like, we, we love to go to Disney, but now we, we would love to go into, into the universe and experience mm -hmm. it and feed it. So, yeah. uh, this is what mm -hmm. I see. I think it's a pretty compelling vision. Um, Akela, I just saw a comment. And by the way, for all the folks, um, there's a purple button on the lower right. Please feel free to add comments. We're excited to, you know, bring people up who have Good comments, just like Kayla, um, who has been on our spaces before, but just had a really interesting comment on the last discussion. So I'll go to Kayla first before John, um, So, because uh, I know you have something on this. Don't want to stick to politics too much, because we're going to be talking about crypto trading with AI. Uh, and I know we have both AI experts and crypto experts, and in many cases, AI and crypto experts on here. Uh, but Kayla, what may be perhaps the last uh, fine point on the um, election year and AI? Yeah, so... I love the supercomputer topic, for one, and I'm really excited about all of this in general, but, you know, there's no denying that we've kind of seen Hollywood um, come in and do this in the World War II era when they just kind of, like, had a misinformation campaign with Hollywood. So that's kind of my fear uh, in that aspect, but more so vulnerable people and making new rules to protect these people. The current rules don't that exist right now, um, they don't protect people a as it stands because we're... A, not democratizing the tools. So not everybody has this kind of technology or the access to it. So when you see this kind of stuff, you're going to trust it right now because a few people have it. And when there's scarcity, you just you naturally trust it. So that's my main concern. And before it gets to a democratized state, which I want, I think we need to make laws that protect vulnerable people and children. So like when you see these commercials today and it's like, you might have been the victim. I don't want to see those commercials in 10 years with AI. You might have been the victim of an AI scam phone call. So I think there are situations and um, honestly possibilities to capitalize on the tools to protect vulnerable people from this situation. I'm more concerned about vulnerable people than I am um, the elections right now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of interesting things. I mean, also, like I mentioned, there are wars and lots of conflicts around the world where AI can definitely be harnessed. I mean, AI is being used now in wars. I mean, that's just very clear. I mean, the U.S., the Pentagon is only one of many governments using them very effectively um, uh, as we speak. Um, so, John, uh, Mike, over to you. Welcome. Welcome to space. And before I actually go to John, uh, I want to welcome Brightpool, who's on the, who's on the stage. Um, Brightpool is our partner for today. Excited to have them. Uh, and uh, we're asking a question with them later. We'll have an 
15 minute AMA with them at the end of this space. So look forward to your comments and questions on that. Uh, but it's about trading with AI and the question mark is, can you trade better with AI, which I think is a true and interesting question. So John, I'll hand the mic over to you. What is, what's the latest while we're on this news segment? Uh, what were some of the latest developments with either AI or crypto? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I missed a little bit of the initial context in the conversation, but I wanted to make just a general comment on the topic. I think, um, you know, AI is going to be probably more influential in trading than people might realize so far. And I think a big part of the reason why is you look at AI over the years, we've had a lot of narrow AI models that are very performant, very efficient, very fast. Um, but a big part of the last few years in AI has been general models, models that have, you know, a very deep understanding of the entire world. And people are using them for specific, like, use case niche applications. And, of course, there's a lot of inefficiency included in that right now. Like, if you're using GPT-4 to do something that a narrow AI model could do, you know, you could be using a thousand or a million or a billion times more compute. But there's this periphery of nuance to anything in the real world, especially with trading, because it involves the, the whole world and it's, you know, it's, it's chaotically... Uh, uh, influenced by any, everything that happens in the world, that you really need general models to be able to push beyond the capabilities of narrow AI. And so as general models continue to get smarter, and especially as they get faster and more efficient, which I think is going to be a big theme of the next few years, more so than the last couple, um, it's going to start to become the case that for not that much money, you can have a general model do something like make a trading decision very, very quickly. And so I think, like, of course, it's been a little bit too early to use things like LLMs um, in any sort of useful way in trading uh, so far, but I think they're definitely going to become very useful for it and become a very big part of the way trading works. All right, John, I think that's an interesting point. I actually kind of want to push back. I mean, you know me, I love to push back. Um, you know, it's, it's what makes for good discussion and learning. Uh, and I don't even know if I agree with this, but if I were to push back, and it's great we have David here, I'm going to go to you, David Tal, um, you know, so so we can get some, you know, there's a lot of AI experts and then some TradFi, uh, or at least the investor perspective, certainly, um, and the crypto investor perspective, of course, as well, The um, uh, for you, David. Uh, but John, the question I'd ask is, aren't the big hedge funds already using, you know, first off, there's, I mean, there, there's an interesting Netflix series, Dumb Money, right? But it, it captures, you know, uh, you know, how retail kind of, you know, you know, kind of overtook uh, some of the big hedge fund investors with GameStop. Uh, but that's kind of the exception that proves the rule, right? I mean, retail loses to, you know, the big big cats on Wall Street all day, every day uh, for a variety of reasons. And one of them being large hedge funds have had effectively AI, well, perhaps not the modern version of AI, but just, you know, certainly algorithms that do algorithmic trading. The biggest example is Renaissance Technologies, Rentech, um, their stuff like Bridgewater and what it, what it, what it does. So Aren't the people, and I'm not even sure that AI tools here will even democratize to the extent that we might affect, I mean, democratize finance and trading. Because, you know, when the CPI numbers come out, the, literally the nanosecond a CPI number comes out, CPI is consumer price index, for those who don't know, right? It's the measure of, it's a, it's a measure of inflation. I think it's largely contested by people as a measure of inflation. But, um, you know, it's, it's like it, there's a, a nanosecond that happens and, and the, there's a reaction to the announcement. There's no way a human could have reacted to that, but all these algorithmic traders will react and the price of gold or the price of treasuries or whatever just jumps up and jumps up or jumps down, uh, depending on the situation. So i uh, hand the mic back to you, John, but I'm curious, like, what, what is it about AI that, you know, what specifically can it, could AI change about trading? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really the perfect question that you asked to push back and, and kind of delve into a little bit more nuance here. Um, so the first thing I'd point out is like AI is kind of a vague term. And to your point, a lot of the algorithms that people have been using even for decades could be considered AI. And I think maybe one of the most helpful common terms is this distinction between narrow and general AI. Um, what I would say there is like, if you're familiar with the mathematical concept of like a Taylor series approximation, um, you can start approximating something by doing very simple high level terms and then you get deeper and deeper and as you get deeper it gets more expensive and more iterative to figure things out and so the way that markets tend to work these days is these very you know capitalized automated hedge funds they have algorithms that respond to fluctuations in frankly a more simple way 
than long-term investors operate. So they're, you know, making a ton of money by responding to simple signals very quickly, very, very quickly in most cases. Um, and then, you know, the broader market of like bigger funds that have long-term strategies and theses and consumer investors, they will correct for the extra nuance and complexity that the algorithms miss in those first few milliseconds. And so the two points I would make are right now, general AI is still subhuman in its capabilities. Like GPT-4, for instance, it can go way beyond the average human on most things because the average human isn't trained and skilled in most tasks. But for you know, comparison to skilled humans, it still falls short almost everywhere. But I don't think that's going to always remain the case. You know, in narrow AI, we have models that are far beyond human capability, even like, you know, the top level human capability. Like in chess, we have models that are much stronger than Magnus Carlsen, for instance. And I think it's, you know, possible, perhaps even already locked in, that that's going to become the case in most skill sets for general AI. And so the question is, first of all, when that happens, how big of a part of the long-term trading and that sort of correction after the initial milliseconds will general AI be for trading? I think that's definitely going to be a big factor. But then also, as general AI models become more time and cost efficient, can they actually enter that realm of a millisecond decision or a 10 millisecond decision? And if they can, that means they'll be able to disrupt the algorithms that high frequency traders are using right now because the models that traders have today they're very useful, but they still don't account for the complexity that something with a real general world model can. I actually think that's such a great point because the added nuance to the CPI numbers I was talking about. So CPI, if you ever watch it, there's like a time it gets released and it's a whole report. What's fascinating is there's something that reads the numbers because something will move nanosecond. And then very quickly, like things will readjust like in the seconds to minutes after, as what John said, people are reading what the nuances of the news are. And, um, you know, and then they react in a different way than just what the pure numbers say. So I think that's fascinating. The question I would ask just in general, maybe I'll go to David Tao, but just a general question is, is that mean that this is a democratizing force or is it just the big cats get, get more, right? So um, David Tao, yeah, I'll go to you and then uh, go back to AGI, maybe John. Yeah, yeah so, so, uh, so let me give a l little bit of perspective on this. So I, I've been um, <clears throat> pretty deeply involved in sales and trading since 2005. Um, it's only a short time, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, it's not, it's not my entire career. Um, before that I was a lawyer, a boring lawyer. Um, but so when I was, um, so I, I started on the sell side at Credit Suisse. Um, and I would say it was the, the earliest days of, um, awareness of algorithmic trading, right? So algorithmic trading had been going on before then, uh, but I think it became, I think trading desks became keenly aware of it and not just equity trading desks. I, I'm sorry, I was, I was on the high yield and distressed debt trading desk and it became, you know, it, it became... What a time to join. What a time to join the high yield desk, by the way. Oh, yeah, totally. No, it was, it was <laughs> I was awesome. in leverage finance. I was in leverage finance, uh, Levfin, as they call it, in, uh, around right. the same time, too, by the way, David. So, right there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Excellent. I'm sure. We, on we, the banking side, that, though. So, yeah. On the, we on probably the have some good, some good war stories to swap. Probably. <laughs> exactly. So, so it became, you know, I, I think people became keenly aware of, um, you know, algorithmic trading, but, but there, there are two pieces here, right? The speed is one thing. Um, and then I think with respect to AI, um, it's about the decision making, right? And so it, it became clear, um, the speed thing was, was, was you know, it, it was brought to the forefront, um, by the guy who started, um, bats, um, and it, it you know, I, I think that will forever be, um, you know, people trying to, you know, be winning that race. Uh, but in terms of, of making the right decisions, right, you, you, you go ahead and, and people use different types of, you know, large sets of data in different ways. You can go ahead and count the number of times a particular word is used in a paragraph by, you know, the, the Fed chair in a speech versus the last time 
that speech was given and how many times they used the word, I don't know, transitory is a good one that comes to mind in terms of inflation, right? But, um, and, and certainly you can make trades on the basis of that and the machine will be able to count those words a lot faster than a human being will and be able to make the trade on that basis a lot quicker also. Um, but, but when it comes to AI, I, I, I'm thinking more about, um, you know, and, and also people have been, you know, stuffing large dumps of data into models for a long time in terms of you could sign up for, you know, getting the number of automobiles in the parking lot of a Macy's, you know, across the country. Uh, and you could dump that into your model, too, and figure out whether Macy's is a long or a short based on how full the lot is at 1130 a.m. every Tuesday. Um, so so that type of, of data, I think, has been, you know, being crunched now for, you know, a solid, you know, 20 years. It's been getting better. The amount of data that's been collected has been greater. Um, how much you weight each, each piece of data, you know, is really going to be left up to a human in terms of the AI, the AI part, I, I, I believe where, where you want to go ahead and get to is essentially anticipate what, what the humans are going to go ahead and do or do what the humans would do better. And, 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 and th there, I think, is the rub, right? In other words, if you, if you assume the majority of the market is, is human, uh, that, that, it's, that decisions to buy or sell are being made on the basis of humans, right? That AI has to be as stupid as a human in order to compete or may have to be, you know, just as tad stupider or a tad smarter than the human. But it can't, it can't assume that the human is so dumb because at the end of the day, the, the market is a consensus mechanism, right? And if the majority of participants are humans, your, your AI model could be super genius and get the quote unquote right answer but if it's on the wrong side of consensus, at the end of the day, it's going to be a losing bet. Um, and so, therefore, I, I, I think that, you know, I, if you, first of all, you know, with respect to um, LLM and, you know, generative AI, whatever governments are plowing, you know, in terms of resources into this, um, you can bet your bottom dollar that hedge funds are way, way, way ahead, right? They, they have way more resources on a per capita basis to go ahead and dump into this um, than the greatest out there, right? Two Sigma, Citadel, um, 0.72, uh, Renaissance. Um, these guys have been hiring, you know, the, the, and been paying ridiculous numbers. I mean, I have a friend whose kid got hired straight out of Harvard um, with a comp side degree, and there's only a few coveted seats, but he's getting paid starting salary out of undergrad starting salary of a half a million dollars by Citadel, right? To sit and just crunch, crunch, whatever he's crunching all day long. I don't know, but he's crunching something. And so th these guys are working morning, noon, and night to go ahead and come up with better and better models. I'm not, I, again, I, I go back. I'm not a quantitative investor, nor am I an AI aficionado, uh, but I believe that these folks are going to go ahead and, you know, do their best. They, they know the market. I mean, the people that they surround themselves with in these shops, not only sometimes do they know the market from being in it for bunches of years, but in the case of Citadel, I mean, they're a market maker also, which is just mind boggling, right? They know how the market moves. They know what the, you know, the blood and guts of the market is all about on a day in day out basis. They have more data about trading, you know, than most anybody does because of the amount of order flow that they get. So, I think so basically that, the rich get richer in, in your view with AI. I, I mean, they, I don't know if they get richer, right? Because sometimes well, they get these guys are awfully wrong. They are yeah. from time to time I mean, like awfully wrong. Yeah, the whole movie about the does stuff. fail. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I do believe that if anyone's going to get it right, I, this I could say with certainty, if anybody's going to get it right, these guys are going to get it right. I think it's so fascinating. AGI, let's uh, hear, hear what you have to say with David Tal. Uh, we'll go to yes. Kale as well. Yeah. Yes, the rich get richer for sure. So I've been contacted by, by a lot of banks, but I, I turned them, them down, of course. Um, so uh, so the LLMs are general world models. That's very important. The AI will be able to, to read face like Jerome Powell and see what that person really thinks. So... We cannot do that. We can do that a little bit, but the AI will be 
able to do that at superhuman level, to see what people truly think when they, they say something. Also, what is even more important is agentic AI, plus reinforcement learning like Superdina will give the power to make, to design and to deploy superhuman strategies. That means that we have some strategy for trading that exists, that are there. But agentic AI plus RL will design new strategies that are superhuman level, that when you deploy that, you will just, you will just win. And that will be deployable very, very, in a way that the, the inference will be very fast. So if you combine all of that together, then you win. So there is no question about that. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that, I, like I said, I've been contacted by, by the banks and so on, and they, they are extremely serious at winning. So I will say the, the rich get richer. Unless we deploy, for example, trading agent in a way that is decentralized, which I'm doing. That's why they don't go for the banks. But uh, if, if apart from that, the banks are winning and the hedge fund will be winning and they will take full advantage of that, they will take full advantage of that agentic AI, that agentic AI are coming there, there right now. <clears throat> so they will be deployed very fast. So yeah. uh, so I, w I will see that. So that's, all, that's why we are talking about trading and trading AI right now, trading platform. It's, it's becoming highly interesting. So I've been working on that for the past seven years. And it was possible to do seven years ago, but not that much because we did not have the... We didn't have enough computing power to train on a large world model and so on like we have right now. But right now it's becoming highly interesting. And combine LLMs plus agentic AI plus the ability to do that inference very fast. And it, it's very, it's highly powerful. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. The um, comment on that, and I'll go, I'll go to UKL afterwards, is, uh, you know, David mentioning, you know, this uh, person out of Harvard getting 500K starting Citadel. Uh, what's fascinating is actually how much the tech companies, the Fang, right, the Magnificent Seven, whichever one you want to call them, has caught up to the pay. Because, you know, some, some kid out of a good CS school can make, you know, not quite that, um, generally speaking, but, you know, kind of up to 200 plus K. Uh, I remember the quaint days when, I mean, I haven't been in a Fang company in several years. I, I used to be at Facebook Meta. I was at a company, Oculus, that got, got acquired by Meta um, many years ago. But uh, so not familiar now with what the best practices are, but I was trying to hire good CS people. And it's, what's funny is that people right out of Ivy League get more salary than somebody with like three to four or five years of experience, right? Back then, you know, maybe it was like 150K. Now it's more like 200 plus, including stock and all that. Um, and a few years a few years in, you're getting up to that Citadel, you know, category. Um, so yeah, just uh, tech is just really caught up pace. Uh, it's really hard to hire good talent, especially in the AI space. And when you do, you, you pay a ton of money for them, right? A senior, what is it, L9 at Google, you know, the, the high-end high software engineer is like $3 million total comp right per year right so that's just kind of what you're competing with and when you're a startup it's really hard to pay for uh, good talent um so yeah tech is really caught up to finance uh Brightful, you want to say something welcome welcome to the space yes hello guys it's luca from Bar brightpool there is uh one uh, important factor that i think we should add here um that if we talk about crypto and uh, ai usage for trading for models there is one significant thing and this is the data we should remember that uh on blockchain, everything is transparent. So you have the data accessible for everyone. You can literally check every transaction. You can track those transactions easily. You have exchanges marked, etc., etc. That's that's not the situation that we have on a regular financial market. And uh, everyone who construct models knows that the data is 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 the gold. Like the you know that famous saying that the data is the new oil. So if you have a good data, your model will be even better. And here, there is that part of democracy that everyone can access blockchain, every can, everyone can get transactions, and everyone can uh, build a good model. Well, of course, if you, if you have certain skills to do it. And uh, let me show you a quick story with you, what we did with our model. We've built a model that uh, predicts volatility. Uh, particularly it's the volatility of Bitcoin and Ethereum at the moment. And uh, you probably remember 2022, November, when FTX collapsed. One week before oh, FTX yeah, collapsed. I was, I was watching it. It was <laughs> like a movie being played out in real time, right? <laughs> yeah, that's this true. A lot of emotions, you know, people lose a lot of money, etc. So everyone remembered that. And uh, one week before uh, FTX collapsed, our model started to show 
that the volatility for next seven days uh, will be two times higher than the implied volatility that traders on very big predicted. And we literally thought that the model is broken. Like we said, no, 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 no. Impossible. You know, it's like, uh, for sure, there is some problem. We started to look what's going on, you know, what is the problem, but couldn't find nothing. And then FTX collapsed and our implied volatility was almost perfectly realized. Uh, and it was huge for us. Like, we just find like, there is like, you know, it's understandable, but we had that huge aha moment, that moment of realization that actually everything is in data, in blockchain tra transaction. You can say one week, that one week before FTX collapsed, that people already knew and they were already preparing for it. And our model just spotted it from the data. Of course, we didn't know that the FTX, FTX will collapse. That's not the case. We couldn't point to FTX, but we just knew that something will happen and that could be read from the data. And that's the, I think there is the difference between traditional markets and the blockchain. Now you have the data open and there is a lot of smart people around the world uh, that can uh, work on it. And uh, someone, previously someone mentioned uh, the, the case of the, uh, the, the, the Robin Hood and the GameStop, uh, Game, GameStop uh, action, the dump money, uh, the, 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 the Netflix series. Uh, so, you know, and what if we have uh, like uh, a lot of smart guys that will connect together, you know, in a decentralized way uh, that will actually build such a model? You think it's possible? Like, they, can they beat Bridgewater, etc., in predicting uh, a blockchain, uh, blockchain transactions, volatility, uh, when the price will move? I think it's really fascinating, and it's a question that uh, I'm thinking about a lot. Can I ask a question? So is it Luca or Lucas? Um, I wasn't able to hear. Luca? Um, which of the two? Uh, so the question I want to ask you, uh, Luca or Lucas, is what is your view as to why, what were the indicators, if you could explain in layman's terms, right? Why you could, why the model showed the trading activity before FTX. So is it as simple as example? I have no idea. I'm just guessing here. Is it something as simple as whales or people who knew, you know, people actually who are generating alpha, which is a very small percentage of people, usually people who work at hedge funds or do it professionally all day long, knew something was up, right? And uh, they knew in advance and the model picked up on their trading behavior. Was it just something as simple as that? Or was there something else going on uh, behind the scenes in the data? Uh, there is, I don't have like a, a very a strict answer for that. There is a dozen of indicators that we actually track. There we track some like uh, inflows from the exchange, outflows, uh, inflows to the exchange, outflows from the exchange, transfer uh, between, um, uh, between, uh, between wallets, etc. So there is like, uh, uh, I can't point to something really particular uh, that showed it. This is just a combination of the uh, dozens of parameters that showed that we can expect uh, high volatility. It's impossible just to say that, oh, this was this indicator. No, it's like it all, it's all combined. This is like a full model that, uh, that track uh, dozens of different, uh, different behaviors, indicators, and uh, in the end of the day, that sum up that we can to the effect that we can that we predict that volatility will be this and that. That's interesting. So on your point about data, and I do want to get an AGI's question and, and maybe circle back with John and some of his comments since he kicked off the discussion uh, about this. But um, so the data you pointed to um, is publicly available, right? So I mean, what's interesting is you have companies like Databricks. Well, what's interesting is a, a trending pattern where closed companies are doing better than their open source counterparts. Stability AI, Iman Mostak, the CEO, left, right? Um, the company after raising over $100 million, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, actually, he literally left because they didn't have a business model. They were giving away stable diffusion for free, right? Um, so there was no business model there. Uh, you have Midjourney, be and Midjourney, therefore, being the closed source, beating Stability AI, seems to be beating, at least if you look at the scoreboard, right? Same thing with, um, you know, Inflection AI, right? No business model. Microsoft comes in, guts them after a $1.4 billion raise at a $4 billion valuation, right? Um, so, and uh, Databricks just came out with this great model, and they're a closed source company, and they plan to keep the data entirely to themselves, right? I mean, they, that's their whole play. It's like, we're not going to share your enterprise data the way OpenAI does. Though OpenAI did just in introduce an enterprise plan, really fascinating. So I think for $25 a seat, um, two seats minimum, you can actually have OpenAI not keep your data, at least according to them. Uh, so that's fascinating. Also closed source. 
but the blockchain stuff is all open, right? I mean, you can download, what is the Bitcoin blockchain now to download a whole node? It's like 500 gigabytes or something, maybe a little more, uh, especially with ordinals and stuff. It's a little more. Okay, John says this is, and he knows more about this than me. So yeah, about half a gig or half a terabyte. Other other blockchains can be bigger or smaller, but what, like, if the data is just open, what, what and you said data is the oil, then everyone, and when everyone has oil, doesn't mean no one has oil, right? Like, what do you think? Me? Uh, actually, yeah, this is open to anybody, anybody who has a perspective on it, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, right pool, but yeah, just whoever, whoever wants to jump in. I, I think it is absolutely true. If everybody has oil, then effectively nobody has oil. You know, like everybody has air, but nobody talks about having air. Um, so that's true. I think um, one thing that we've definitely seen in AI is even when companies quote unquote open source their models, there's this uh, nuance around like, what does open source really mean? Is it just the weights that are open? Is it the training data and practices that are open? You know, there's a lot that's involved in creating an AI model and deploying it. So um, I think we've seen consistently that companies are more likely to open source weights than certainly the underlying data. And that will probably continue to be true because models more or less are just, you know, a probabilistic representation of the training data. And so that's really where the value is. Um, I think that trend will probably continue, but it is kind of optimistic to look at uh, fields like crypto where everything is inherently open by default. It kind of has to be. Same thing could be said for like, uh, you know, web technology. Like one thing that I think is actually underappreciated, this is a slight tangent about um, the web, is that all the client side code on the entire internet is completely open source because it has to be delivered to browsers. And I think that's been a big part of the reason why the web can often advance ahead of native applications for mobile or desktop. Um, and why, for instance, LLMs are so good at doing, you know, JavaScript code compared to like Swift or Kotlin code. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think crypto is a very optimi optimistic direction. Um, and, and hopefully we will find more use cases beyond currency and uh, increase the number of uh, data points that are out there that are useful um, that remain public and kind of like have resilience in, in always being open. Super fascinating. Uh, AGI, what do you think? Oh, and Kayla, yeah. by the way, I do read comments because Kayla just t tweeted, uh, what is it? Uh, compute, is the new oil. compute is the new oil. So yeah, I guess NVIDIA is the oil, <laughs> NVIDIA is the oil field. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, AGI, but I'll, I'll pass. Oh, actually, yeah, Luca, if you want to jump in. Bipole, by the way, anytime you want to jump in, feel free, of course. But yeah, do you have a response? with John. Yeah, sure. So I wouldn't say that uh, everyone that everyone has oil. Yeah, maybe everyone has oil, but in fact, you need a gasoline. You know, you need to refine it. You need to make use of it. Uh, if you want to drive your car, then, you know, <laughs> then there is a whole process. And the same is with the data, that you need to process the data. And uh, you've mentioned that company raising a lot of money and making their model not, not eager to share it. I'm not surprised uh, because they have a huge advantage right now. Uh, at the moment, we are not ready to share our model as well because, you know, markets are adaptable. So if you share that model, if, if they share that model, and for example, they put that model in chat GPT and everyone can use it, that model becomes useless because everyone trades according to that, market adapts, and that's it. The model is lost, it's gone, simply speaking. So there is that advantage. And then... The beauty of blockchain being open um, gives us the possibility that everyone can improve it, and uh, this is this is um, that's the the part of the blockchain democracy, democracy that uh, personally I love. Uh, so here, I think that we will in, in I believe that in blockchain space we will see um, that the chase in. Uh, predictive analytics, that the new model will be rising and rising, market will be adapting, and I don't think we have end to that. Super, su super fascinating. Yeah. And, and by the way, and we'll get to the MA, but this is just, I mean, this is our topic at hand. But I mean, um, Lucas, are you focused on consumer, like a consumer facing platform? Or are you focused on like enterprises like hedge funds or, or you know, large banks? No, we are uh, focused on uh, consumers. It's uh, we are not focused on institutional players. It's pure, purely for uh, uh, retail uh, traders. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool. Um, yeah, Kayla, you haven't had the mic in a while, so maybe I'll, I'll pop over to Kayla and then uh, AGI and AK. Yeah. 
So I think what, you know, John was referring to is the future of AGI, right? Because if you can go to a narrow or a general model uh, and do anything else with it, that's AGI, right? So if you can go to a general model and say, hey, general model, ChatGPT, tell me the stock um, prices of today. You know, that's general, it's AGI. So that um, that is why it's so important that we have access to that um, as a general population, because once we have AGI and they just have more compute than us, it's compute fighting against compute because it's unsupervised learning uh, at that point going against unsupervised learning and whoever has more compute will win. And so that's really just the rich getting richer on a, on a very new level. So it's, it's difference between like a high frequency trading algorithm that they're using right now and then them being able to use an AI trading system combined with that, like what AGI said. And once that happens, it's just compute versus compute at that point. Can I push back? Uh, just a question on that. Um, d generally, kind of directionally agree with it, but if you, if you were to think about... Um, so it, it's really fascinating how you set up that, that, that framework, but like, it, more compute isn't always better, right? I mean, you know, right now, what is it to train a foundation model? I mean, I think Databricks spent 10 million, which is a lot less than GPT-3.5, by the way, uh, for, the latest, um, for the latest play, but, you know, estimates are you can train a decent foundation model LLM for you know, hundred in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that number is just going down. Um, so, and uh, you look at look at Open AI, right? I mean, there's been studies about how GPT-4 has degraded because of the amount of people that have been using it. Um, you know, I think and it's quality so, of data sometimes as well. So, mm -hmm. because you know, once they have people using it on such a large scale, they have people corrupting the data also. So, I think it's like when you have a closed compute versus a closed compute. Um, I think that's a little different. So, like maybe maybe that's different. But I agree with you completely. Once you've, I think that they have corrupted a lot of data sets by just letting it out on the public. Yeah, super fascinating. Since uh, Kayla mentioned AGI, I'll pass the mic to AGI and then go to AK. The two A's. The, the fact is that the blockchain data is public, of course, but the blockchain is part of the world, and the world data is not public, is not completely public. So, still, the institutions are going to win, uh, because if you just rely on the public blockchain data, you have much, much less data than the the institution. And I will see also that the best strategy will win. So, not the best compute necessarily but the best strategy. So if you have the best strategic agent, you are going to win. How do you get that though, right? Yes. Question of the day. But yeah, I mean, agreed. Yeah, if you can, I mean, that's alpha. That's free alpha right there, right? Um, you know, all day long. Uh, it's just kind of a matter of how do you, how do you create it? Because like, um, you know, uh, David Tal was talking about the market being a consensus mechanism, which is different from the sense of the crypto consensus mechanism, right? Uh, but, you know, in some ways similar uh, in terms of theory, right, of what, what they provide. Um, Lucas, did you want to jump in before I go to AK? Yeah, actually, I I agree with AG, uh, because uh, if we take, for example, a chat GPT open AI, for an example, a few days ago, I read an article that someone was using chat GPT to ask for a Bitcoin price, uh, and uh, they had some model called crypto wizard, crypto, uh, sorry, finance wizard, that was uh, like a add on to, to ChatGPT. And you know, the, the answer of ChatGPT is that uh, it's highly probable that Bitcoin will reach 78,000 in 2024. So come on, it's not the answer. I know that <laughs> I don't need to ask artificial intelligence for that. I'm pretty sure that it will reach 78,000 uh, this year. We want to know what will happen next week. We want to know what will be the direction of move, etc. I don't know how OpenAI is actually doing those um, mm, uh, those predictions, you know, what kind of data they capture and uh, what kind of data should GPT use to answer those questions. But my assumption would be that this is more like a social data than actual uh, transactions, because here uh, I consider ChatGPT as something like more general. And if something is general, it's not specialized. And if you want to uh, predict financial market, you need to specialize solutions for that purpose. You know, if you even for uh, uh, if you want to predict an uh, indicator as volatility, uh, like volatility, you have some special algorithms to do it. If you want to predict price or the direction of price, this is another set of the uh, algorithms that you need to um, deploy for that. So um, I think that here is, as AG said, the best strategy will will win. In fact, it's uh, data is important, 
but uh, what you do with that data, that's the key. So Lucas, are you ingesting data from, I mean, clearly data from every transaction seems like just table stakes, right? In order to train your models. I mean, what about ingesting data from like some of the DeFi pools or some of from the, you know, like for example, the DeFi exchanges, like a DYDX where you have like inverse swaps uh, on Bitcoin and you have basically like, you know, order books on, on some of these uh, derivatives on crypto. I mean, there's a lot of information to be gleaned there. Um, probably a lot of it, probably a lot of insights too. I mean, are you, is that part of the data set uh, as well? I mean, it's yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Simple answer is yes, that we actually track the, uh, if we talk about Bitcoin, there's like, we track the whole movements on Bitcoin, same as on Ethereum, like uh, uh, we trade movements. If you talk about DYDX, that's actually a movement uh, that, uh, that, uh, are done between exchanges and wallets and they're changing volumes uh, and uh, you can find the sentiments there uh, etc so yes actually that's that's what we are doing and um, we are training our model um, every uh, right now it's like every two weeks that, that's really interesting so I mean of course we have um, I mean if every blockchain operates differently but um, you know ethereum for example the mainnet operates on universal coordinated time and very specific kind of like slots and blocks. Um, I mean, are you capturing that data every second? I mean, that's got an enormous amount of data, right? I mean, all of Bitcoin as a ledger is only, you know, it's only about half a terabyte, as we talked about. So not very much. But I mean, if you start tracking all this stuff, I mean, you got to have like large data centers with lots of lots of space, right? I don't know, or AWS or something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 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 you need to analyze those data, it doesn't ch change too much. Uh, in fact, when you build models, um, uh, you want, it's easiest to build the model for the assets that have long history. Uh, actually, if we talk about, uh, if we talk about building models for Bitcoin and Ethereum, we are like at the edge. Uh, for example, to build reliable model uh, for an um, altcoin that is traded, that was traded just for one month or something like it, that's close to impossible or simply impossible, or maybe this is out of our scope at the moment. Um, so, uh, so there is, if you want to be really, um, really, if you want to have, if you want to have a good predictions that you need to, um, build a model for tokens that have some story, that has some, uh, history that you can dig into deep into data and check it you know for years actually and last week doesn't change doesn't change so much in that so that's why you don't need to uh, don't need to train it so often and uh, in fact if we talk about predicting volatility it's easier to predict volatility for longer terms than for short terms that's at least uh, our experience that we have uh, ex uh, we have much higher accuracy with predicting volatility when we talk about one month uh, or two weeks than one day or three days. Is that a function of just like that being just easier? Just like you said, it's easier to predict Bitcoin's price over the next year. Um, well, in some ways, I mean, of course, it's impossible to predict anything. And by the way, for the audience, none of this is financial advice. Of course, do your own research. That's true for any space we do. Um, but yeah, I mean, isn't it the function of volatility measurement? Isn't that just more the, the near term in general in uh, minute price movements? are just harder and that's just been historically true or is there something else going on here that's new yeah it's, yeah the simple answer is yes actually that's that, that that's the case like it's really difficult to to it's it's like guessing you know what will happen tomorrow you it's hard to say but what will happen in one year uh, then you have different perspective and you can uh, you can analyze much more data for this yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, kind of like in 08, 2008, during the financial crisis, when the VIX just shot up. VIX is the measure of volatility, right? The volatility index. And, you know, a lot of people got squeezed because, you know, it was just so unpredictable. It moved so fast and everybody was moving into treasuries, which was the flight to safety. Um, yeah, it's a fascinating discussion. AK, I know you've been waiting a while. I'll, uh, give the, uh, I'll give it to you. Yeah, so I was thinking... Sure, thanks. Uh, <coughs> go ahead. Oh, go yeah, ahead. AK. No, it's AK. Uh, we'll give to AK, then we'll go to AGI. So, AK, you go first. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, I see. I, uh, not to be the young elephant in the room here, uh, but you know, a lot of the AI movement and what I'm seeing transpire in the last couple of years gives me some uh, slight glimpses of the you know dot com bubble. 
um, you know, where you have so many competing factors that are trying to innovate in one single small space that is, you know, getting billions and billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars in funding, uh, you know, on a daily, monthly basis. To me, that gives me a little sense of, um, you know, risk aversion and, and, and seeing that there's some froth there. Um, and in terms of, you know, when we're discussing AI or trading better with AI, you know, we consider things like scripts and tools and algorithms, um, you know, being a portfolio manager where I've traded both sides of the world, I've traded the stock market, I've traded the crypto market. Um, what I've seen in thousands and thousands of hours of backtesting, and this is just from my perspective as a trader, price action psychology, um, you know, it's a lot easier to manually look and be, have a kind of a human feel to the market um, as opposed to maybe trying to do predictive in a lot of the times. Um, you know, quants have been around for a long time in hedge funds, you know, over 10 years, 20 years, quants have been writing code um, in terms of predicting the market or having bots that would out trade the market again. Um, I see that there's a lot of inefficiencies in that and, you know, there, there is going to be an immense amount of innovation, but I don't just think it's a way up and I, and I don't, don't think, think, you know, a lot of the participants are going to be around uh, in a couple of years. And, you know, when I'm saying this, I'm coming off of a thousand point, you know, S&P 500 short that I just announced yesterday and came true today. So, you know, it's publicly on my profile there and it's not to show myself or anything. It's just, to, you know, to, um, to Bright, uh, Bright's point here, um, you know, it's actually a lot easier to predict tomorrow's action as opposed to next year. There's no way in hell a technical model or a price action model will be able to tell you where things are going to go in a year. You need to look at the news. You need to look at fundamentals. You can start putting AI models together to look at economic data or things that can assist you in predictive. But in terms of price action and psychology, in my opinion, you know, it's very, it's, it's probable that you can predict very short term price action and you know volatility in the markets by just looking at the technicals looking at the psychology and uh, really following through and if you have a certain discipline um, you know the manual structure of, of just taking these tools into consideration and using them to your advantage again you know c catching like a thousand point move on the S&P um, you know where many people can't predict that or maybe an AI might not ever see that could, could, could come close the manual sense can catch that so um, I'm Am I excited about AI? Absolutely. Have I backtested thousands and thousands of hours of my own code? Yes. Has it been able to automatically perform better than manual? No. So that's why we still place manual trades after we look at our backtests. And um, you know, it's it's a it's it's a it's a it's an evolving landscape. It's an evolving market. And I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see a lot of industry leaders and a lot of innovators, um, especially related to blockchain that come out of the, the, the space here in the woodwork and really become industry leaders. So I'm very excited for it, but I'm very cautious in my opinion. And I, I get a lot of dot-com vibes, um, especially from the whole market in general right now where, you know, the feds are stuck uh, at not knowing, you know, when they're going to lower the interest rates and um, propel us even higher. Uh, so exciting times, but also very cautionary times, in my opinion. And uh, always, always make sure you backtest your models, you know, hundreds of times before you automatically allow it to trade your funds for you, um, you know, while you're not present. I, I, I think it was awesome and I, uh, awesome comments. And I actually have some questions, um, maybe a bit of pushback or, or really just a clarification question, right? So, so part of it is... You know, I, I think AK is pointing out that this has been around for years, um, like, and that, you know, that we've been talking about that earlier. But, you know, you're talking about different kinds of investing styles. So technical trading, then there's algorithmic trading, there's value investing. I, I presume you're talking about something more related to technical analysis as well as, you know, momentum trading, perhaps, or momentum investing as opposed to like a Warren Buffett value investing style, for example. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I think that's where data would most help you in the short term, especially when you're using AI and you're using, you know, technologies that would probably get you information at your fingertips much faster than if you were to look for it yourself. That's where I would see AI helping and assisting in longer term investments. But in shorter term investments, you're really going to have to have something that beats like 90% of the bots on the market for you to be able to succeed. And from my research, again, in the industry, you know, again, managing multiple portfolios across markets, it's just I've never been able to employ anything that was smart that could automatically trade. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't exist. It's just I haven't been able to fully trust it myself. 
And that's the curve that I'm getting over. And that's why uh, I'm always on the lookout, obviously, for innovation and tech. But um, yes, my trading, my trading psychology is uh, price action. Um, it's very rarely any indicators. I just look at the volume and I just look at market structure. Uh, couple that, of course, with the fundamentals of what's going on in the world. Add in a little bit of research. Do a top-down approach. Start from the indexes and go down. Um, to individual tracks, and uh, you'll find inefficiencies everywhere, you know, as, if you're looking for that. Um, and AI, like I say, is, I think, just an accelerator. But if you use it incorrectly or if you're in, in the wrong bed, you might end up blowing your accounts or losing money or uh, not having a pleasant experience. So uh, to me, it's just, it's just cautionary, um, cautionary uh, advancement. Do you think AI will have more use or will make bigger strides in like a value investing, long-term multi-year play kind of a thing where you have a thesis versus technical trading? I mean, where do you think AI makes an impact, more of an impact perhaps? Absolutely. Well, which one though? If you Absolutely. choose maybe both, I mean, it could be just all of the above, but I, I, I would say, I would say, I mean, innovation is, 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 you know, evidently going to come. Why? Because, you know, 30 years ago, or maybe, maybe a little bit longer, like 40 years ago, that's when technical analysis really started to become very pre prevalent. You know, there's always been books on technicals written, but because of the lack of um, having data and knowledge, like, you know, back in the 1920s, um, when somebody would get their, you know, their look at their stocks or what they own or portfolio, they're getting it in the weekly mail and they're looking, they're reading their newspaper to look at the chart. Well, very hard for you to make a reaction when you don't have the minute minutes of what's going on in terms of activity. So in the 1980s, things got better. Computers started coming out. Uh, obviously that gap started closing computer, you know, bots started quotrons. trading the yeah, stock yeah, market. The quotrons, right? <laughs> you, you know, and, and here we are 20, 30 years later, now, now, now we're AI, you know, so of course it's going to keep uh, innovating. Of course, um, you know, the markets are ever changing very soon. It could be all bot traded and very tight, you know, uh, controlled. I don't know. Uh, but again, I just because of everything that I've seen and, you know, being a young investor coming up in the industry in the early 2000s, you know, you want to find inef you know, inefficiencies or ways you can make money at faster than other people. Um, I haven't been able to find a code that does that that's automatic. So uh, if somebody has that, I'd be happy to take a look at it. But for now, um, the manual process is, in my opinion, the manual naked eye to looking at your investments and portfolios, as long as you have the time for it is, is your best bet. Yeah. It's My interesting. Uh, constant refrain, we keep saying it's uh, not AI that takes your job, but a human using AI that takes your job is uh, partly what we've been saying. But AGI, uh, Mike, is yours, and we'll mm -hmm. be moving to the uh, AMA with Brightpool. Yeah. In that case, I know that uh, we say that, that uh, it's uh, human that are using AI that will take our job, but uh, I'm working on AGI trading agent, and I'm the, on the sovereign Turing test. So uh, I think those... AGI agent will be able to do kind of any, anything like value investing and so on. Uh, they will choose their strategy according to the objective that we want, of course, according to their goal. And I think they will be exploiting like the technical analysis that, that the human knows. They will have to leverage to exploit that because if people are doing that and it's known, then you know that what they are doing and you can exploit that. But uh, I, I, the way I see that is that... Uh, I'm working on AGI trading agent that will be strategic. And so I'm launching the sovereign Turing test. So that will be AGI agent. Can they use, for example, start with 100,000 and make it to a million dollars? That will be the sovereign Turing test for an AGI trading agent. And if you have those, then you can sell those via NFTs and so on. And it's, it's extremely, it's, it's, it will change the world. Uh, of trading, of course. So well, I mean, uh, if you believe in efficient markets, though, I mean, the the cost of the AGI agent should be the amount of alpha that it that it is able to generate, right? I mean, isn't that yeah? yeah the, the, that the cost. Yeah. So, uh, so I will sell them via NFTs, and uh, each AGI agent will have its own identity and be fully trackable and chained and so on for responsible AI and things like that. And mm -hmm. uh, the value will be determined according to market, of course. But uh, people want to have leverage, so. I guess the strategy to sell them will be d decided by an AGI also. So, mm. uh, but it's 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 mm. highly interesting because now we have agentic AI. Uh, the ingredients are there, and if then we move to quantum computing, quantum AI next year, then it's it will be so so fun. Uh, so so much value will be created. Yeah, so, and uh, Bitcoin goes to zero, right? Okay. Well, I, 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 it's not financial advice, nor protection. I don't know. But let's say let's say that um, 
let's say that we might move to other kind of encryption and things like that. Um, yeah, yeah, there's like quantum proof encryption in theory, yes, right? Yes, I mean, there out there, is, there I think is. there's some, there's some I, chains that are like that, but I'm not I, sure if Bitcoin I gets think, there quickly. I, I think Ethereum is quantum proof. Is it? Maybe. Like Ethereum 2.0? I don't think it is. I, I, I've read about that somewhere. No. Ethereum was quantum proof. I, I don't know at all about Bitcoin, but I think Ethereum is quantum proof. I, I've, yeah. I did read about that somewhere. I don't have the source in front of me, but I still so I have daily coin. I don't, I don't know how reliable they are. I literally Googled it because I was pretty sure Ethereum is not quantum proof, but I'll just read from this article from March, 2024. So obviously just, you know, not too long ago, Ethereum explores a hard fork and quantum resistant cryptography to combat potential threats from quantum computers. Uh, that's daily coin. I, know, I actually don't know daily coin, so I don't know if they're reliable or not, but yeah, just that's the first thing that shows up on Google. Uh, who knows, though? I, I do think that chains should be thinking about quantum proofing themselves, uh, for sure, because uh, I worry that Bitcoin will be is so laggard. I mean, look at the block size wars, right? I mean, Bitcoin's going to be so laggard at it that, I mean, I've been a fan of Bitcoin. I've been in Bitcoin since, you know, for over a decade, 11 years now, 2013. So as I think a lot of you know, um, still a hodler. But uh, yeah, those things worry me when the block size wars is like, can we go from, you know, two megabytes to four megabytes in the huge block size debates, uh, huge uh, kerfuffle over that. And of course, you know, we had to have SegWit and native SegWit, um, you know, jump in, uh, which were kind of just made by people outside. And now Ordinal is also made by people not in the Bitcoin Core developer, uh, not people contributing to the GitHub repo for Bitcoin Core. Uh, it's people outside who are, you know, creating advancements. Um, but we all we all like Bitcoin, uh, at least some of us do. Um, so Nick, uh, welcome to the space. Before I go to Brightpool and Lucas, uh, just to maybe get your thoughts on any of this, we did start out by the, I put it up in the nest, the the video from Two Infinity AI. So uh, I'm, I'm sure you have some thoughts on that. But any of this, any of these things before we go uh, into the AMA shortly? No, not much. I mean, I don't think I'm in a position to really speak on uh, on trading and stuff with AI. It's not my not my realm of expertise. So yeah, yeah well, we started with fake images. The entire the entire space started with like the. You see, I don't know if you see the nest, but the Two Infinity AI thing. Uh, oh maybe this yeah, is a the brief respite. Uh, sort of like hey Jen Deno, uh, yeah. you know I, I am I'm pretty morally against any form of deep fake. I think that they're a net negative for society in general. It's one thing if you're using it on like your own, uh, you know your own likeness to generate a video like the one that you put in the nest. Uh, I would argue like there's is this <laughs> is this the realm that uh, we really want to be exploring for uh, AI technology like. We could we could turn on a camera and record a video of ourselves pretty easy. Like, is is doing a generative version of it that uh, that interesting or that compelling or pushing us that much further? I don't know. I would argue it probably isn't. And when it comes to deep fakes, I think uh, there's sort of an obligation for anybody who is a proponent or an advocate of AI to pretty much just avoid them like the plague. Uh, I think it's important that you know, people understand what this stuff is and what's possible and what deep fakes are. And they need to be alerted of the potential uh, danger, whether it's like your grandparents knowing that spam calls are going to sound maybe just like me because I have, you know, hours of, you know, content of myself talking that could easily train on and, and make it sound like I'm calling her or even just like getting a scary picture that looks like me in like a bad situation or something, right? These these types of things are uh, are going to start becoming a lot more prevalent, I imagine. And I I try my best to not talk too much on deepfakes or share or sort of like put my time and energy in that space because I do think it's it's just a slippery slope that leads us to a place of like not being able to trust anything online, uh, having really no trust in public communications. I think it completely destroys any sort of like meaningful democratic political discourse that can be that can be had. Um, it just it just seems like a really a really bad thing, and we're we're already like it seems inevitable that it's going to become ubiquitous everywhere, and that we are going to trend towards a deep fake society. Uh, so. I find it important to sort of like enlighten people on the the actual technology, but but not lean too heavily into like spending my time building things that enable it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know this is uh, yeah, this is a whole Pandora's box. I think we're gonna go back to crypto trading, but I you brought up so many things that I really look forward to, to chatting about in future spaces. We actually have one on something specifically on this at three p.m. pinned to the top of my profile. If 
people are interested. But uh, yeah, that'll be a different topic. Um, so we're going to go to Lucas. So Lucas, we've been kind of doing the AMA directly with you kind of throughout this whole thing. But why don't we go back, rewind and say, uh, tell us about Brightpool. Uh, give us a sense of what uh, the what your product offering is. And yeah, just, just uh, I mean, we'll look forward to teeing up questions. I think already we had a really engaged set of speakers who I invite to also prep questions for Lucas. But yeah, Lucas, the, the floor is yours. Sure, thanks. So Brightpool, it's a decentralized trading platform that pays user for placing an orders. So what we've done, we've, uh, we've created a platform with limit orders that gives you a yield. So actually you are placing the orders like limit orders and uh, locking just assets for some time and we pay you for that. Uh, and that um, the amount of the rewards that you will receive for a particular order is calculated actually by AI with use of the uh, Black and Scholes model. So um, what is really cool about the platform is that there is no fees for trading, not at all. You have uh, zero fees and uh, instead of uh, fees, in instead of commission, you just get paid for placing the orders. I think it's really, really awesome. I guess I guess the question is, um, what's the way in which you make money if there are no fees, right? I mean, that's always a classic question. Um, what's, the, uh, what's the process? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm used to it. It's literally the first question I hear when we say no fees. So it's the, so the answer is the, uh, it's in a way how we settle the orders. So, um, uh, let me give you a quick example. Like imagine that you would like to sell, um, let's say Ethereum for 3,500 in seven days. Uh, or tomorrow, whatever. Let's say tomorrow. Uh, then, um, you place that order. You locked one ETH in our platform. And uh, just after locking it, you get paid for placing the, that order, for locking your one ETH uh, for one day. Um, and that reward is paid in our tokens. And then you wait one day. And uh, exactly after 24 hours, we have uh, two scenarios. If the price is lower than uh, 3,500, then actually nothing happens. We just give you that one ETH back. And of course, you keep the reward because it was up from payment. That's it, it's finished. But there is a second scenario as well, that the uh, price is higher than 3,500. Let's say that it is 3,600. Uh, then you receive, uh, then you actually receive what you requested. So it is 3,500 and the difference that $100 is the bright pool's revenue. Uh, that's how we make money. And it works in a similar way with buy orders. Uh, but the logic is opposite. So the, if you want to buy for 300, 3,200 and uh, the price is higher, then we just give you back on it. But if the price is lower, 3,100, uh, then uh, you receive that, uh, you receive the one it for 3,200 and that $100 difference uh, is the bright pool revenue. And the beauty of it is that we give 96% of that revenue back to the token holders uh, by uh, with the buybacks and burn. Yeah, and I guess you also get money on the liquidity, right? I mean, just from uh, like holding the liquidity for seven days or something like that, do you get the float on that? I guess to an effect, I guess you could stake that ETH, for example. Uh, like a bank. Well, that's no, mm -hmm. this is on our roadmap. We don't do, at the moment we do, we do nothing with those assets. They are just locked for the period of time. Uh, in the future, we plan to give uh, people possibility uh, to use their assets in another platform. So let's say you lock it for seven days, but then the, the, that one it, the, but then you are able to take it, take that it, and lock it in Lido or Engine Layer uh, to get additional yield. And it will be all all for users. So it's all like a user uh, centric. And uh, you mentioned liquidity pool. So the beauty of Brightpool is as well that we don't need. Uh, liquidity providers. Actually, we use external DEXs to settle the orders. So like the order is settled for Uniswap, for uh, SushiSwap, whatever, you know, whatever other DEX with liquidity. That's really interesting. Do you use any like derivative exchanges like a DYDX or is it mostly like Uni and Sushi, which are more like, you know, um, you know, like on L1s or certain L2s like USDC, for example? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's more like a pure DEX. It's not uh, DYDX. It's more like Uni or uh, you know, the other decks. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Much simpler, right? I mean, these, these derivative exchanges, the DEXs can, are super cool, but they can get really complicated really fast. Uh, so you, you mentioned the Black Scholes Merton model, of course, something a lot of TradFi folks uh, would know very well. I'm sure AK is very familiar. Um, but um, how does that go come into play here? So 
you're doing some kind of options pricing, right? Basically, uh, so you're running Black Shoals. I mean, you know, what is how's that different from say any other trader? You know, using their own Black Shoals methodology to try to price price in the probability uh, of you know where you know an option might be might be going or volatility specifically might be going. And are you using like a random walk? Like, is it just traditional Black Shoals or the traditional random walk, or are you using something else, some other methodology there to calculate what the price is? <laughs> No, it's not a traditional black and shoals model. This is uh, a modification. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, but I don't remember exactly the name. Car one and someone else, like uh, because I don't, I'm not the author of the model. Um, so, but that's that's the black and shoals model after years of improvement, actually. Uh, so, um, how we use it? Um, so there was a, like a lot of we had a, a huge conversation about hedge funds etc what we do actually we bright pool is like a little hedge fund let me put it this way uh, that we implement uh, one of the hedge fund strategies option strategy strategies that is called long straddle uh, so what bright is literally doing we are buying options like a lot of a call and put options so this is like a buy and sell orders uh, and we have them, let's say, in our portfolio, and then we make money on volatility, simply speaking. Uh, so it doesn't matter which direction market will go, whether it will go up or down, we will make money on it. And every order is priced with use of the Black & Scholes model. So here we have a very interesting um, concept that the Black & Scholes model, as you're probably, probably many people here are familiar with it, it's a zero-sum game. It means that in a long term we should make as much money as we paid. So um, we pay in the every every pool in Bright Pool will have its reward token. Like for the first pool uh, that we will launch on Bright Pool, that um, token is called Bricks, and it's a reward for Ethereum USDC USDT uh, per. And people are paid with this with this token, but the actual uh, revenue that is made by Brightpool is in stables and in it. And then we use that revenue uh, to do the buybacks. So actually, we set at the at the very start of the exchange, we set a price of the of the BRICS token, and then uh, we support that price with the revenue that is done from trading, uh, from um, order settlement. Further, we have a reward reduction mechanism implemented that actually we pay less and less token, but in, in the same time, we still make the same revenue. So we are actually um, able to support higher and higher price of that token. I think it's fascinating. So you're getting paid on the volatility. I guess, you know, questions are what happens when, you know, there's no volatility, right? And then the second question in addition to that is, it seems this isn't this can't be a pure alpha strategy, right? It's not a pure ar arbitrage because you have to pay the option premium, right, on both the call and the put. So therefore, you're you're kind of losing money there, right? Or how do, am I am I missing something in the equation? I mean, it sounds fascinating, by the way. Thank you for taking the time to lay it out. Mm. So uh, we don't do arbitrage. Like actually, there will be uh, interesting uh, opportunity for uh, option arbitrageurs uh, because. Uh, you know, we pay the actually we pay the premium in the um, in our token. So if the price of that token is high, then there might be a situation where on Brightpool you have the highest premium at the market. So if someone is an option arbitrager, then simple they can sell option on Brightpool, buy it somewhere else, and you know take the difference. So uh, Brightpool will be interesting platform to do that. Uh, so this was one part of your question. There was a second part, but I just lost it. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I think AK, AK had a comment, so maybe AK jump in with either clarification. I mean, I might be missing mm -hmm. something. I, I often do, so I'm, I'm not saying it's just more of a question. AK, what's uh, yeah? What are your comments or questions? Uh, no, I think I, I think I understand the uh, part of what they're doing. Actually, the, the 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 premium that you're collecting off of your straddle is that deposit that you're saying that the customer makes, and they have to hold for a, a day for it to actually strike is that correct so then you're actually just collecting your premium and you're managing your long on volatility or, or your short and like you're you're making money off of other people's money this way correct uh um, yeah, not and that's how i assume you're, that you're able to pay your fees like we pay premium to the people and we buy options for it and then we settle those options uh, mm -hmm. absolutely and you collect your yeah and but you collect your premium up front when they get when they give you the deposit when they put the order or the bid in uh, no, 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 we don't collect premium, we pay premium. 
like user sell options to us. We pay premium. Uh, we make uh, revenue on the settlement of the order. So the premium yes. goes to for the trader. Yes, yes. It's a good model. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good model. It's just so, so. What's what? Where, where do you guys ever see Max Payne? Like, what's your Max Payne? Where, where do you ever leak? Like, where, where? I mean, it's probably where there's, no long, there's, where there's minimal vol, or am I, there's no vol. Yeah, there's no yeah, I'm assuming if the market is yeah. So you're long vol. If the if the Bitcoin, Ethereum, or uh, other assets, we will add because the, the Ethereum and Bitcoin wrapped Bitcoin, of course, will be our first assets. Then we will add. Uh, that probably it will be infrastructure tokens. Uh, we are working on how to build a model for uh, mean tokens as well, since we are in the new season, and that might happen as well. Uh, but if the Ethereum volatility will turn to the you know euro dollar volatility, then we might have a problem. I don't see it like a real. Uh, in fact, before we started that uh, that project, uh, uh, which was uh, which was late 2021. Uh, we did a research on uh, Bitcoin and its volatility and uh, whether this that model will be profitable or uh, risky. And actually, our research, you can read that research, that research is actually uh, available on our website, Brightwood Finance, uh, done by Poznan University of Economy. Uh, and um, uh, that research shows us that actually, uh, uh, in, uh, usually there is like a, three or four weeks period that has uh, such low volatility that might possess a threat uh, for price. Of course, that was passed. We, you never know whether it will change. But uh, looking at the current market conditions, we can see it as a, a real threat, especially launching in this market where we are right now. What's super interesting about this, uh, I'd love to get your thoughts, AK, if you, I just saw you unmute, but what's super interesting about this is being long vol can be problematic in TradFi, especially, as you said, uh, Lucas, that there is no vol. But in this case, I don't know, like, <laughs> the crypto is super unpredictable, but the one thing you can maybe count on is vol, of course, you know, famous last words, and, you know, maybe we enter a super long non-vol cycle. But uh, yeah, AK, I mean, comments on that? I mean, I, I just find it so, so fascinating. No, I, 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 I like it. I, I'm, I'm about to uh, sign up or look at your uh, exchange here and uh, maybe see if uh, I can utilize it. So this is, uh, this is awesome. And zero fees are, are huge. I mean, um, so many times we'd be, uh, you know, uh, selling some of our bags or doing a lot of, uh, you know, activities. And then you end up paying, you know, three, four five percent in fees sometimes, depending on how many transactions you're putting through. Um, so like what you have going on is, is very disruptive, of course. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm definitely uh, interested in checking it out and maybe signing up. So kudos to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, def it's, it's, def it. yeah it's definitely a, a new model. I've, uh, I've never came across, uh, the protocol, uh, like, uh, like Brightpool and what is really um, for me, what is fascinating here is that we are very like uh, community centric because uh, you know ninety six percent of the revenue goes back to the tokens. So actually, we will do the buybacks of the tokens and we will burn them. Uh, so it is like a bright with like a little hedge fund that is owned by a community. The holders of the of the bricks of or the BRI token uh, will be participating in uh, our revenues, 96% capitalized through the uh, buybacks and um, and burn. So that's, um, and uh, another interesting thing is that uh, the early supporters, those who will use the platform early, they will have uh, the highest reward for placing the order. So it is, uh, of course, it's very profitable to be first. At the moment, our token is live, it's, uh, it's, it's already traded, uh, so you can um, so this is available, but the platform will be available uh, in next two weeks. I, I, super cool. Um, one question actually about this uh, long straddle that you're talking about. So it involves creating calls and puts on, for example, Ethereum. How do you do that without doing um, derivatives, right? So are you creating synthetic calls and synthetic puts? I mean, it's been a while since Finance 101, and I, it was always a you know, banker and private equity guy, but yeah, I mean, are you creating synthetic calls through Uniswap, SushiSwap, or are you doing something else, right? Because you could do this easily if you did DYDX or some derivatives exchange, you could just literally just buy, you know, do inverse perpetual swaps and stuff, but how do you do it when you aren't using derivatives? 
Oh, so actually, it's really simple. Uh, it's it's really simple. We, um, if you go to our website like demo.bypool.finance, there is an interface, uh, and it's a demo that is available for uh, testing and for uh, for trading with the test tokens. Uh, so um, you can see what is the experience. Uh, users actually they place orders that are similar to limit orders. So what you're doing. Um, you you come to the platform and you let's say that you want to sell it for some price. So you choose that price. You choose how much it you would like to sell, and you choose for how many days it will be locked. And then you locked it in our platform, and uh, we just keep a ledger of those transactions, and then we settle those transactions after um, after the certain amount of time. So, uh, for example. Uh, if you want to sell that ETH for uh, 3,500 tomorrow and the price is 3,600, tomorrow what we will do, we will, we will just take that one ETH that you locked in Bytepool smart contract, we will, uh, we will sell it on Uniswap uh, for 3,600, pay you 3,500 and keep $100 of revenue for buybacks uh, of our token and for burning them. So uh, I know that there are some protocols that build options on Uniswap V3 uh, with a concentrated liquidity. It is possible to do that, but no, we don't do that type of stuff. Uh, this is just a, uh, you can say that what we did, we did the simplest option uh, trading exchange in the world. It's, it's really simple, uh, very simple. Like we are giving community the possibility to uh, play options uh, without even knowing that those are options because this is, this is so easy. And we have a, such a new approach in terms of interface and in terms of trading. Um, yeah. Yeah, su super cool. You know, I could go at this all day, but I think we're, we're well on time. Uh, you know, I just have so many more questions. But, I mean, this has been a fascinating discussion in general. And I feel like I've learned a lot. So, I guess I'll just leave it to you, Lucas. Um, to uh, I don't know, AK, if you had a last thing, because I was going to go to Lucas for less time. I'll just say one yeah, thing. Hey, okay, I just looked at your launch, and I see that you've had uh, on launch about 12,000 individual participants. Again, kudos to you. It looks like you guys have something right figured out. And, um, uh, you know, I can't wait to uh, start looking uh, to use uh, Brightpool. So, nice job, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, there were there uh, there was uh, there were a lot of traders using our demo, so uh, it's pretty pretty well tested. It was very important for us to test the model before we will launch it and to see uh, how it will perform. And actually, uh, since November two thousand twenty-three, twenty-three people traded four hundred uh, million dollars volume with test tokens. We made one point point six million revenue. And there is a support price for a BRICS token. So we were starting uh, with uh, 0 0.15 cents, I think, sorry, 15 cents. Uh, and uh, actually that price grew to 42 cents. So what does it mean, BRICS support price? It, it means that we are able to buy the whole tokens from the market and burn them, burn them at that price. Um, so that shows us that actually what we did is, is it's fine and this is working. Um, okay, so as per final remarks, I just, um, thank you, uh, thank you for having me here and I wanted to invite all of you, uh, for a special event because actually, literally right now, uh, we are launching a liquidity pool on Uniswap. Um, at the moment, our token is traded on Gate.io and MXC, and literally right now we are at the point liquidity uh, to Uniswap. So if you will go to our uh, Twitter profile, that is X, as you can see uh, here, I'm speaking from that profile, uh, in a few minutes you will see the, um, a post over there. Uh, with the uh, with the address of that liquidity pool, and we prepared a twenty percent discount for participants of today's AMA. So uh, uh, first comers will have that opportunity to to, um, to enjoy the discount. So you are all invited, and uh, we just launch our commercials. So if you will come to uh, our website as well, you will see. Uh, I convert right to a commercial that we just, uh, that we just uh, put live, that we just put online. It was recorded by one of my uh, favorite comedy directors. I hope you will love it, guys. Uh, this is the director, like we watch his movies in Polish, in, in Poland, in cinemas. 
uh, great sense of humor. Uh, so uh, enjoy, I invite you to check this and uh, to take a part in our liquidity pools. Uh, that's incredible. Yeah, I wasn't, by the way, even though I'm co helping co-host this, I definitely had no idea that this would be this announcement. So congratulations and thank you for breaking that on the space. It's a huge honor to, to, to have that. I'm looking forward to, to checking it out. Um, so yeah, thank you, Lucas, uh, for that. Um, I know you asked you for final remarks, but that was such a big bombshell uh, in a good way uh, that I would just want to maybe go back to you and see if there's anything else you want to say uh, before we uh, finalize the space. All right, sounds like that's it. All right, ending on a big note. All right, well, I, want, I just want to say a big thanks to um, everybody. I want to say a big thanks to the audience. Uh, loved your comments. I was reading a lot uh, throughout the space. You guys had some very intelligent and very interesting things to say. I want to thank all the speakers. Uh, you guys had great questions. This was just a very lively uh, discussion, and I feel like I learned a lot. And big thanks to Lucas and Brightpool. Congrats on the progress. I look forward to seeing uh, where things go in the next coming days, months, and, of course, years uh, as we continue to build the future of Web3 and the future of finance. So thank you and thanks to all.